heard this story. Uh, there was uh, in this church. There was a uh, a man in that church. He was really a, quite a brilliant man. He was raised in a Christian home and and uh, was homeschooled and uh, and really just excelled in his in his field. Went off to college and uh, uh, got a uh, went all the way through college. Got an earned doctor's degree. Was an engineer. Brilliant mind. And uh, he was a, a kind of a pillar in this church. He uh, was very faithful. He was a giver. Uh, he, he made a, a large amount of money. He made over $100,000 a year and was just a faithful giver in that church. He faithfully taught a young adult's Bible uh, class and, uh, and was a deacon in this church. And uh, he was just a faithful leader, uh, like I said, a pillar in the church. Well, uh, one day he went out and he bought this really fancy tie, this really nice necktie, uh, very, very costly and uh, there was a lady that, 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 when she saw it, had made just a comment in passing to him. And, uh, and he just got greatly offended by this uh, comment this woman made about her tie, his tie. And, um, and he was so bothered by it. In fact, it happened between the Sunday school class and the main hour uh, of the service. He was so offended that he just went home. He said, uh, you know, that, that's it. He went home. And, uh, and, you know, there's a bunch of stuff going on at the church, and the pastor didn't quite notice his absence. And then they had the, the evening service, and he wasn't there again. And the pastor thought, this is odd. I wonder what's going on with, you know, brother so-and-so. And, and then he missed, it in the middle of the week, the, the, the deacon's prayer meeting. And I was wondering, you know, what's going on? So finally, it comes around a week later. He finally gets around to calling the guy and checking on to see what's going on. And he calls, and his wife answers the phone. He says, yeah, you know, his brother's so-and-so there. I've been wanting to talk with him. And she says, yeah, hold on a minute. And, uh, and she puts the preacher on hold, and he's waiting, and he's waiting, and he's waiting. And uh, we're going to wait a while. We'll come back to that story uh, later on in the message as we tie it in. You know, um, let me read you this quote. I want you to think about this before I read our text. Someone said this. We are in a war, and the enemy is out to set. Uh, uh, excuse me, the enemy is uh, set out to defeat you, to stop you. But he wants to do it in such a way that you will agree with him that it was justified. You will willingly accept defeat, and the way he will do it is blank. I want you to think about that. I'm going to read that again. I want you to think about what might go in the blank. We're in a war and the enemy is out to defeat you. But he wants to do it in such a way that you will agree with him that it was justified. You will wittingly accept defeat. And the way he'll do it is blank. In our text there in Psalm 119, we're going to pick up in uh, verse 161. It says this, Princes have persecuted me without cause, but my heart standeth in all of thy words. Psalm 119 is all about God's word and the relationship to God's word. He says, though these princes, those in leadership have come to persecute me uh, without a cause or anything, he's clinging to the word of God. Verse 162, I rejoice at thy word as once, uh, as one that findeth great spoil. He says, when I open up the word of God, I find great spoil. I find riches. I find, uh, boy, I'm just blessed beyond what I ever set out to find. Verse 163, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. He's contrasting truth with lying. Verse 164, seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Now get this verse, 165, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Let's read that verse together out loud if we could. Ready? Begin. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Let me read that quote again. We are in a war, and the enemy is out to defeat you. But he wants to do it in such a way that you will agree with him that it was justified. You will wittingly accept defeat, and the way he'll do it is offenses by offenses. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I do ask that you'd help us in this time, in these next few moments, Lord. I believe this might be one of the most needful messages uh, for today and for longevity in the Christian life. I pray, Lord, that you'd touch our hearts. I pray that you'd help us to see with spiritual eyes. And Father, I pray that you'd be glorified. 
Father, if there's one in our midst that does not know you as Savior, as their hope of heaven, I pray they'd get that matter settled today. And Father, I pray that your people would be helped. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Title of the message is, Are You Offended or Are You Unoffendable? Last week we looked at, Judge Not. This week we're going to look at, Are You Offendable? Are You Offendable? Why do people use that term? Well, you know, you shouldn't say it. The Bible says you shouldn't judge. Why, why do people lash out and say that? Because they're offended. See, we already have people leaving. <laughs> um, in Luke 17, uh, verse 1, you don't have to turn there, but Jesus said this, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. Here's what Jesus was saying. He's saying, mark it down, you will be offended. Mark it down, folks, offenses will come. Offenses are going to come. First thing I want to look at this morning is uh, the possibility of offenses. The possibility of offenses. You see, uh, don't look now, but offenses are coming. Don't look now, but hey, an offense is coming your way. Uh, it's not just a possibility like, hey, uh, it might happen. I may be offended. There might be an offense that comes my way. No, it is a fact an offense is coming your way. You will be offended. Turn to the person next to you and say this. An offense is definitely coming your way. Now, <laughs> uh, turn, uh, turn the other way and say this. Someone is going to offend you. You know, I'll probably offend someone before the service is over. Amen? Amen? In fact, I don't think I've done a good job unless I've offended somebody before the service is over. <laughs> Mark 17, 1, offenses will come. Uh, I'm sorry, Luke 17, 1, offenses will come. Those of you in here who are married, you ought to look to your spouse and say, I don't want to, but I'm probably going to offend you. I don't want to, but I'm probably going to offend you. You say, um, someone's probably offended because, uh, in this room because I told you to tell someone that they were going to be offended. <laughs> someone is probably already offended that the preacher made you do something that we weren't comfortable with. Amen? Um, offenses, listen, they, they come. Uh, look to the person next to you and say this, pastor is probably going to offend us today. In fact... Uh, mark it down. If you stay in this church long enough, I will offend you at some point. Now listen, I, I'm smiling. Amen. My aim is never to offend you. I don't seek to offend you. I don't, I don't go out of my way to try to offend anybody. And I hope that I never would offend anybody. But the reality is offenses will come. And we're going to explain why they come. We're going to explain where it comes from and everything in, in a minute. But the reality is this. One of my jobs as a pastor is to feed the flock of God. I'm to feed you. Amen? And, and sometimes we don't like Brussels sprouts. Amen? I'd rather have a, have a Twinkie. <laughs> Uh, I don't want the health food sometimes, but, but you know, a parent says to a little child, you're going to eat this. You can't have dessert until you've had something healthy. Amen. And, and sometimes, uh, like if you go to the doctor and they tell you, hey, look, if you don't change something, you're not going to live very long. Uh, we don't want to hear that news. We don't want to hear what's coming our way. But sometimes it's just absolutely needful, isn't it? It's a necessity. And so God has arranged this structure. It's not my plan. It's not tradition's plan. This is God's plan. This is God's outline uh, as far as church and a pastor and these kinds of things. And it's my job to take the Word of God, and the Bible calls it a mirror. We're to look into the perfect law of liberty, and we see things that don't line up in our lives, and we're to make the appropriate adjustments. In other words, in order to make these adjustments, you and I must look into the Bible and say, in this particular area of my life, I am wrong. How else can I make the adjustment? I have to admit, I have to confess that I've been wrong in this area, and now I must get that thing in line. All right? By the way, when you don't do that, you have what we see in many churches today where you can't really differentiate between a church and a nightclub. Right? 
Because they, they, they don't want to offend. They don't want to judge. They don't want, you see what I'm saying? And so let's all just come together and hold hands and sing Kumbaya on. We're all just going to have a great old time. You know what's sad about that is this. The church is full of people that will never get their eternity settled. Why? In order for you to get saved, in order for me to get saved, to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I have to admit a few things. I have to realize that, first of all, I can't save myself. No amount of good works, no amount of uh, nothing that I can do in my own flesh can save me. I have to come to grips with that. I have to realize that my sin offends a holy and just God, and because of my sin, that I'm deserving of a sinner's hell. I have to accept that. I have to come to grips with that. Only then can I fully accept the free gift of God, which is eternal life, that He would pardon all my sin and accept me just as I am and put His righteousness into my account that when I stand before God, He sees His perfect standard. Amen? There's nothing I do. But in order to get there, I have to realize I've been wrong. Maybe, maybe some people were trusting in a religion and they have to realize that my religion can't save me. Maybe they were trusting in some sort of ritual and realize that ritual can't save me. You have to come to a place where you realize, I am wrong. And let me just say this, if you will not budge, it will just be an offense. Are we okay so far? So sometimes we have to come to grips with truth. We have to come to grips with the butt heads with reality and be offended. Sometimes the offense is not over truth. Sometimes the offense is over personality differences. Sometimes the offense is because people don't, don't use a, a proper filter in their mind and they just speak everything that comes to their mind. <laughs> you may have been around people like that. The Bible says the fool uttereth all his heart. And people say, I just tell it like it is. I just speak my mind. Yeah, the Bible has a word for that. It calls you a fool. <laughs> Amen? And now you're offended. Um, <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is this. Sometimes you just can't help it. Sometimes it's truth. So don't shoot the messenger. Amen? Sometimes it was just a personality conflict. Um, we'll look at some of these things. You know, I've offended my wife on many occasions. And I thank God for a godly uh, wife that ta- deals with things biblically. Amen. And learns to forgive often and to deal with it. I don't, I don't aim to, I don't seek to, to offend her, you see. The reality is this, that uh, offenses will come. I had you look at each other and say, Pastor, probably going to offend us today. I want you, church, to look at me and say, Pastor, Pastor, I'm probably going to offend you at some point. I know. I knew when I signed up for this gig. I've been offended a lot. I've been hurt a lot. In, uh, in this very church. Um, you see, it's not a question of, is our offenses going to come? They are going to come. What are we going to do with it? Are we offended or are we unoffendable? The question is not, are they going to come? Uh, they are going to come. They're coming our way already. They're already in motion, if you would. Uh, but are we offended or unoffendable? Have you ever noticed how many, um, how many illustrations are in the Bible uh, of, of, uh, in, in nature, um, uh, uh, in animals and stuff that are great illustrations of biblical truth? You ever notice, uh, you know, for example, the Bible says in Proverbs, consider the ant thou sluggard. You know, they're calling us lazy. And he says, consider the ant, how hard they work and they build up for winter. And they're, they're just working diligently, working, working, working. You ever see the ants? You ever, you ever gone and like knocked over an anthill? You ever done that? Anybody? As a kid, maybe? Or set fire to it? I did that in Iraq. And, and it was funny because uh, over there in, in, in the Middle East, they have these giant ants. I mean, they're big. And, uh, and we poured some lighter fluid and <laughs> lit it on fire. Ants started coming from everywhere, running. They're jumping into the fire and they're burning and falling down. And I was like, these guys, they're, they're trying to you know, do whatever they can to save the queen or the colony. I don't know. God save the queen. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, you knock over that anthill and watch them all scramble. And what do they do? They instantly start rebuilding. 
I mean, don't you think one or two of them would be standing off to the side and being like, I'm not building that again. He's standing right there. He's going to knock it over again. No, they don't consider that. They just, they just start working right away and start getting it back together. So he's telling us, consider the ant. When you're considering your work ethic and your diligence, think about that ant. You see, there's some great illustrations in the Bible. I heard a story, a preacher was preaching on 1 Corinthians 13. We call that the love chapter, where it talks about a different kind, a higher kind of love called charity. It comes from the Greek word agape, this selfless love. And, uh, and the, one of the verses there in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, it, um, it vaunteth not itself, it is not puffed up. And he gave the illustration of a puffer fish. How many of you heard of a puffer fish? Okay. Uh, well, swimming around, it looks like a normal fish. But all of a sudden, when there's an irritation, or you can say it this way, when an offense comes, he puffs himself up. He blows himself full of air or however he does. I don't know how he does it. And when he's in that position, all bloated up, he's got these little spikes that come out, kind of like a porcupine. It's a defense mechanism. And he gives illustration that, listen, charity doesn't act that way. When, when there's friction in the relationship, when, when offenses come, you don't puff yourself up in self-defense. You humble yourself. You see? Beautiful illustration. Well, there's one animal that illustrates offenses incredibly well. It is called a baboon. How many of you know what a baboon is? All right. It's, a, it's an African uh, animal over there. And, uh, and, and what they do, this, this, uh, this guy that studied baboons, and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, it's amazing how people can just give their life to studying like one animal. Or <laughs> but I always find that interesting. But he studied this animal, and, uh, and he says, um, a baboon will never let go of an offense. He will exact revenge if he is offended. In fact, if you go, if you, you say you find them out in the wild, there's maybe a tree full of baboons, and, and you offend one of the, the members, uh, family members or whatever of these baboons, they will remember you. They'll remember your scent. And they will commit themselves to hunting you down. It may take weeks, may take months, but they will give themselves to hunting you down and, and exacting revenge on however they see fit. It, very interesting, you know, a dog, how do you understand, you can offend a dog all day long and he'll still be your best friend. <laughs> he'll still come back, oh, you love me, right? You love me? Okay, good. You know, uh, this baboon, the baboons, they, they're not that way. You see? Do we have any baboons in here this morning? <laughs> uh, are, are, we, are, we, are we holding on to those grudges and say, I am not going to forgive them until they come groveling at my feet and say, oh, have mercy on me. I'm going to hold on to this thing forever. Uh, this is how we are, aren't we? By the way, uh, uh, the message isn't on forgiveness, but forgiveness is not for the person that offended you. The forgiveness is for the person that's been offended. You're the only one that gets hurt by holding on to the grudge. Amen. So that baboon's wasting all his time stressing, plotting, thinking how he's going to get even. Amen. Um, Very interesting. There was a preacher that was teaching on soul winning, on being a witness. And sometimes when we're teaching on this, there's obviously the Bible, the scriptures that we want to go to and so forth. But a lot of teaching on soul winning is a lot of how-to, how to carry yourself and how to, how to talk to somebody and, how to, uh, and these kinds of things. And the preacher was saying this. He says, make sure whenever you go out and you're going to go witness to people, make sure you have a, a tic-tac or a mint in your pocket and you go and you, uh, you, know, you don't want to have bad breath because understand something, bad breath is offensive, right? <laughs> bad breath will offend somebody in a hurry. When I was, uh, when I was in, the, in the army, um, there was one of my uh, soldiers uh, chewed tobacco. And I just couldn't stand the smell. I'd get nauseous right away. And so I told him, I said, whenever you're talking to me or I'm talking to you, I don't want tobacco in your mouth. And, uh, boy, he went through so much tobacco working for me because <laughs> he'd have to go spit it out every time I'd call him over or whatever. But uh, it offended me, I tell you what. Uh, I shouldn't have to smell that. You know, I'm not, I'm not uh, chewing tobacco. But anyways, so this preacher's talking about not having bad breath and making sure you have the mints and the Tic Tacs. Well, there was a lady in that church who had a gum disease, and she had just perpetual bad breath. And uh, she got so offended, and she left the church. And uh, the preacher starts asking around, hey, where's Mrs. So-and-so been? She's been so faithful, and all of a sudden I haven't seen her in a while. And, oh, preacher, you know. And all the other ladies, by the way, took up her offense. I said, no, I don't know. You were attacking her from the pulpit. I was? He calls her up. He said, Mrs. So-and-so, we've missed you. Where have you been? And, oh, preacher, you don't miss me. You don't like me. And well, what gives you that idea? You are preaching against me in church. What do you mean? 
You are preaching against bad breath. He's like trying to think, what? She says, you know I have bad breath and I've got this gum disease. He said, I had no clue. Sadly, he was never able to make it right with her. She never came back to church. By the way, who's hurt in that equation? Yeah. And uh, so uh, all I'm saying is they're going to come. You see? I've said things from this pulpit that I'm, I'm uh, later on I sit back and I'm like, oh, you know what? That could have been read this way. And, and I'm amazed that certain people came back. Amen. <laughs> You know, I've said, uh, let's move on. If you'll just get in your head right now, just get it in your mind right now, that sooner or later, I'm going to offend you from this pulpit. Um, understand something, by the way, I don't want to offend you. I don't want to offend you. Uh, in fact, I love you. I'd, I'd, I would never want to offend, and, and I would never uh, uh, intentionally go out and offend you. And by the way, let me just say this. If you believe that your preacher loves you, if you believe that I love you, that offense will be a lot softer. You see? Um, I think some people have it out in their mind that I don't and that I'm out to get them. And the slightest thing, did you see the way he looked at me? Did you see while he was preaching? He was staring at me the whole time. You see what I'm saying? You, you start to have this, this issue building up in your mind. I had a lady that used to go to this church. and It's been a while. Most of you probably don't know who I'm even talking about. So, um, But by the way, if you leave, I'll talk about you. Amen? There's further for your, for your offense. Um, but she came and she just had this grocery list of offenses towards me. Areas that I offended her. This huge list. Unfounded stuff. Like... Where did that even come from? And, and uh, she, of course, calls me on a Saturday evening. By the way, don't, don't arrange those kind of meetings on a Saturday evening. All right. Do you really want to sabotage Sunday? <laughs> um, but she uh, uh, had all these lists. And, and quite frankly, I had an answer for every one. But that wasn't it. None of those things were actually the problem. The problem was she had a fence deep down, and uh, she was not willing to reconcile it. You see? But if you believe I love you, you'll be able to excuse some things. I don't think he meant it that way. Remember, charity, 1 Corinthians 13, it believeth all things, it hopeth all things, and it endureth all things. You see? You're going to just believe that the person didn't have ill intention towards you. You're just going to believe, uh, you know. And by the way, if there's still a question mark, go to them and clear it up. Don't stew over and wait for them to call you or notice that you've been avoiding them and uh, go and clear it up. Remember what the Bible says. If you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that someone has odd against you, that means they have a problem with you, not you against them. It says leave your gift there and you go to them. Make it right, then bring the gift back. On the flip side, the Bible says, if a brother has offended you, Matthew 18, you go to them. So guess what? If you're the spiritual one, it's on you. Whether you find out someone is upset at you, you go to them. Or if you realize I'm upset at somebody, you go to them. So there's no excuse. Amen? If you know there's a problem, you go. You don't wait for them. You do it. You be the spiritual one and you go. Are we okay so far? Have, who, have, who have I offended thus far? Amen? All right. Carlos was kind of... <laughs> um, <clears throat> so like I said, if you just get it in your mind that at some point there's going to be an offense, consider how you're going to take it. Consider what's the heart behind it. Amen. Do you really think that I get pleasure out of hurting you? If you do, then it's not going to take much at all. You'll find, you'll, you'll, you'll be offended very quickly. But if you, if you, if you stop, sit back and think, by the way, the devil will capitalize on that and get your mind thinking and get the wheels turning. And, but if you really just step back and think, wait a minute, would he really want to do that? You'll be able to find the intention pretty quickly. I don't think it was his intention. I don't think he intended to, uh, to cause such hurt. You 
You see, here's what happens when those offenses come and you find out and you go to that person. You can apologize. The preacher, this preacher apologized says, Lady, ma'am, I'm sorry. I never would have meant to hurt you. I didn't even know you had this issue. And, uh, and still, she was offended. Still, she would not forgive. Still, and, and you know why? It's because this woman was offendable. You know why? No matter how much I apologize or how much I, I, I share what my true motive was or how, what my intention was or what I was really trying to say, no matter how much I go down that road, here's what's going to happen. There will still be an offense there because that person is offendable. They are offendable. We saw the possibility of offenses. Hey, they will come. Notice, secondly, the positive purpose for offenses. Now, how do you think offenses are negative? Yeah, if I get offended, it's a negative thing. No, no, there's a positive purpose for offenses. There is a positive purpose. Um, it's, it's, there, there is a purpose. It's, it's almost like God intentionally offends you or send somebody to offend you. Now, now, if you understand a little bit about adversity, if you understand a little bit about the biblical place of, of trials in our life, you'll realize that God's behind much of it. People say, God wouldn't, set, God wouldn't send something to hurt you. No, not in the sense that you're thinking. But remember what he said to Satan about his servant Job. Has thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him. Satan did not bring up Job's name, by the way. God did. And God said, he's, a, he's, he's my best Christian. Satan, once you go at him and watch, he's going to stand. He's going to keep his integrity. <laughs> How many of you say, Lord, please don't do that to me? Um, he will, though. The Bible says, of him, through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. God orders the thing up. He comes across his desk, he puts the okay stamp on it for the purpose of his own glory. But he wants to grow us, he wants to work in our lives. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 28 and 29, he says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. God says, I'm going to work all these things in your life to make you like Jesus. Now, the Bible says about Jesus that he learned obedience by the things he suffered. That verse has always just fascinated me. First of all, how does the Son of God learn anything? Didn't He just know everything? Isn't He omniscient? It says He, he learned obedience by the things He suffered. See, a lot of the character, the human qualities of Jesus Christ were teaching us something. Amen? They're teaching us something. And He learned obedience by the things He suffered. And let me just say this. Uh, David said it this way in the Psalms. He says, uh, it's through adversity, through my sufferings, I've learned your statutes. I've learned the ways of God by my suffering. I know God better. Paul said it this way. I mean, you're going to find this all throughout Scripture. Uh, Paul said it this way, that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His suffering, coming into, alongside, the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And that was not something that he said, I'm experiencing this. He says, this is my desire to experience this. And by the way, I believe he experienced it. All right? Uh, Paul suffered like few Christians in the New New Testament. Um, He suffered immensely, not just at his death, but throughout his life. You see, a lot of the Christians in the first century that are martyred, they died suffering, but few of them lived suffering. Paul lived suffering. Amen? There is a positive purpose. Uh, God has a positive purpose for your life in it. How, How many would like God to to take you from where you are now uh, to, to a whole new level in your Christian life. To take you from where you are financially to the next level. To take you from where you are spiritually to the next level. To take you are with your family to the next level. How many would like God to take you to the next level? I think we can all say amen. To that. Sure. Uh, well, how's He going to do that? How's God going to take me to the next level of blessing in my life? He's going to use the fences. Notice the positive purpose of offense. First of all, why God does it. Why God doesn't. First of all, God does it to humble us. He brings offenses to humble us. It humbles us. Uh, he humbles us so He can then later exalt us. Amen? Humble yourselves uh, uh, inside the Lord and He shall lift you up. 
um, humble us. By the way, what in us, what is it inside of us that gets offended? What is it? Pride. Acts, exactly. All right. Desiree wins the money. Pride. It's the pride in me. The reason I got offended is because you touched my pride. Don't touch my pride. That's my pride. <laughs> you touched my pride. And now I'm offended. You see, if I was humble in that area, it wouldn't have offended me. It would have been, as we say, water off the duck's back, right? It just falls right off. The reason I got offended is because pride. The pride was in there. And, and what, what does God feel about pride? Does he like us to be all proud? No. What, what does the Bible say about it? Ze, these six things that the Lord hates, yea, seven are abomination to him. First on the list, a proud look. God hates pride. In fact, you're not going to find one verse in the Bible, not one verse in the Bible, that puts pride in a good light. And we have people walking around all the time. I'm proud of this. I'm proud of that. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just proud to be a Christian. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud of this. Proud of, uh, like, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let's slow down here. I'm just, I would just as, as much completely remove from my vocabulary a word that God hates. Let's just mark that off that that is now a foul word, and I'm not going to have that in my vocabulary. Amen? Now, just because you don't say it doesn't mean you don't have it. But it is part of the battle. If I can at least stop saying it, maybe, <laughs> maybe it'll help me. Amen? What, what is it? So, so it's, 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 it's pride that gets hurt in us, if you would. Have you ever said this? I was humiliated. You ever been humiliated? I had a lady come to me and she said, Pastor, when you said that, I was absolutely humiliated. Something I was just taken just completely wrong. Left the church, an aged Christian. I was humiliated, she said. Now, the preacher side of me said, Amen. I'll tell you why in a second. But as far as the shepherd, the pastor part of me, I was heartbroken. I never meant to offend her. I never meant to humiliate her, especially that strong of a word. Never would have meant to do that. But here's, here's the preacher in me that said amen. Humility kind of sounds like humble. You see, when you're humiliated, that's the, that's the path to get us to a place of humility. I need to be humbled. Why am I humiliated? I'm offended. It hurt my pride. Your pride needs to get knocked down a few notches, Amen. That's the problem. We are incredibly proud people. And God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble, and humility is the opposite of pride. So therefore, to be humiliated is a good thing, because it's humbling. Amen? It lowers you. Can I just tell you a little secret? Here's a, here's a little equation as far as God's working in your life. The bigger you get, the smaller God gets in your life. But the smaller you get the greater God gets in your life. That's how it works. James 4, 6, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You see, He humbles us, brings us low, so He can give us His grace to build us back up. So that it's no longer me, but it's Christ in me. I myself am dead. I'm, I'm crucified with Christ. I've been, I've been put aside. I've been put down so God can build me up. Amen? These are God's equations. In fact, many things in the Christian life are paradoxes. What's plural for paradox? <laughs> These are paradox. Uh, I'm getting a hard time with that word now. Uh, and that is this. The way up is down. Right? The way up is down. The way to blessing is giving. You give out and you get. Amen? The way up is down. Humble yourself and He'll lift you up. He'll exalt you. Crucified with Christ so you can be alive unto God. Amen? These things are, this is a paradox. It's like, uh, this doesn't quite make sense. This is opposite thinking. Amen? How about this one? God says, I'm going to teach you how to fear me by forgiving you. That's not how we would do it, is it? If I wanted you to fear me, I would, do, I would use some sort of dominating tactic. No, he says, I'm just going to forgive you. And when you truly understand forgiveness, the fear of God enters in. Amen? 
Remember Paul, his thorn in the flesh. Lest I should be exalted above measure, there was given to me a, 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 a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. What's exalted above measure mean? Lifts it up in pride. I don't want to be lifted up in pride. God was giving him all these revelations and these insights and a vision of heaven and and the scriptures. He wrote most of the New Testament. And he says, he says that that's a very difficult thing because I could very easily be exalted above measure. So he says there was given me that God sends a messenger of Satan. By the way, God sent a messenger of Satan. Think about that for a minute. To buffet him. That means to punch you, to beat you down lest I should be exalted above measure. And this thorn in the flesh, God, it doesn't tell us exactly what it is. Many people have speculated it was his eye problem or it was his back pain from being beaten so many times or whatever. Whatever it is, he saw it as debilitating. He saw it as something that kept him from doing his ministry to the fullest. And said, God, why have you done this to me? Why, why am I so limited? Why can't you just take it away? Or why can't you just heal me? And God says this. Paul, hold on a second. He begged God three times. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice and might depart from me. And God said, my grace is sufficient. For in your weakness, Paul, my strength is made perfect. Paul then changes his whole attitude and says, most gladly, therefore will I rather glory in my infirmity. Why? That the power of God may rest upon me. Here's what was happening. That infirmity beat Paul down. It made him small. He was buffeted. He was low uh, at a very low point. So when the grace of God came in, it was no longer Paul, but it was God exalting himself through the life of Paul. So when people looked at Paul, it wasn't like, wow, look at this amazing guy. Look at everything he's accomplished. It was, it was like, Paul can't accomplish that in his own flesh. He has, a, he has an amazing God. And they would look at Paul and say, boy, to God be the glory. Look at all he's doing in your life. You, know, you understand, the Bible says in, the, in Deuteronomy that God will share his glory with no one. With no one. You see, when it becomes all about us and God's not getting the glory, watch out because God's not near that thing. He wants you to be so small. Remember Gideon and his 300 men? Who remembers the story of Gideon and the 300? God tells Gideon, Gideon, we're going to go fight a battle and we're going to go up against several uh, thousand people. So I want you to see who all is going to fight with you. Gideon had no military experience at this point. And uh, he's like, okay. And so he says, all right, guys, we're going to go fight. Who wants to join me? A bunch of people come. And, and God says, uh, there's too many. Let them know that anybody that doesn't want to fight, they can go home. <laughs> if they had said that when we were getting ready to go to Iraq, who, who wants to go home? <laughs> you know? and, uh, um, and so a bunch of them left. And God said, there's still too many. Uh, they were going to go fight tens of thousands of people. And so God says, uh, go down to this river and have them drink. And those that bring their face to the water and lap like a dog, let them go home. But those that bring the water to their face, because they're more diligent, they're on guard while they're drinking water, right? We'll use them. He whittles the thing down to 300 men to go against tens of thousands. There's no way they could take the credit for that, is there? It wasn't Gideon's leadership. It wasn't their military might. In fact, they didn't even use a single weapon. They had a trumpet. They had a pitcher and a light. That's all they used and their voices. They hollered out, the sword of the Lord, end of Gideon. And the people, their enemies just went crazy and started killing each other. You see, God does not want to share His glory. He wants us to be small so that He can be big, so that He can be exalted, He can be glorified. Amen? Amen? That's his plan. Paul's thorn in the flesh humbled him so that God's power could rest on him to the point where he said, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. In fact, uh, James said it this way in James 1. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into diverse temptations. Excuse me, the word temptation there means a trial. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. He says, when a trial comes your way, rejoice. Count it joy. Why? Because God's at work. Amen? God's at work. Humility is extremely attractive to God. Humility is extremely attractive to God. He loves it. He draws near to it. He embraces it. 
1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. That's His plan. In fact, He portrayed it in Philippians 2. By the way, God never asks you or myself to do anything that He Himself first didn't do. Isn't that amazing about God? Uh, we love Him because He first loved us. Amen? Uh, so He gives the example in everything. Yeah, He tells us to suffer. By the way, He has a right to do that. Because he suffered, amen? Uh, he tells us a lot of things because he portrayed it. He wants us to give. He gave. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. Amen? And, uh, and that was, which was most precious to him. And so everything he says us to do, he tells us to sing. You know, God sings. The Bible says he uh, rejoices over us with singing. Amen? He sings. I look forward to heaven to hear how God sings. Remember Jesus when he was with his disciples that, the night he was taken? They sing a hymn. I wonder what Jesus sang like. You see, he sings. In Philippians 2, we get a great example. He says this, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. He says, Christians, I want you to have the mind of Christ. All right? We can say amen to that, but here's what he then goes on to say. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So we see this, this um, humbling of Christ being brought to a lower place. Therefore God has highly exalted Him and given Him a name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, uh, uh, every knee should bow to things of heaven and things of earth, things of the other earth, uh, under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, so he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and God therefore highly exalted him. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, that he may exalt you in due time. You see it? The way up is down. And so God's at work. Now, he wants to build you up his way. He wants to build you up in his likeness. He wants to build you up in a godly fashion, not your way. And so what he wants to do, when the offense comes, it's going to expose that pride, and it's going, to, it's going to humble you, humiliate you, and if you take it godly, it will humble you so that you can then receive the grace of God in your life. Now, here's what happens when you don't receive the grace of God. This isn't in my notes, but if you want to keep your spot there, uh, uh, go over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. So when I'm humbled, I, get, I can receive... The grace of God. Look at verse number 15. So when the offense comes, I can humble myself, receive God's grace, or the offense can turn into bitterness. Look at verse 15. Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So here's what happens. The offense comes, and I can allow God to use that in my life to humble me, to receive His grace, or I can resist the great, fail the grace of God. And bitterness, the offense turns into bitterness, and it troubles me, and it defiles those around me. You understand something? Bitter people hurt everyone around them. And bitter people will eventually die alone. Because people get tired of being hurt by you, they will alienate themselves from you. And here's what happens. They put you, uh, you know, you get all up there in age and you need your children to take care of you. They're not going to take care of you. They're going to put you in a home. Because you're bitter. Just all there is to it. We okay? God's going to take you to the next level. He's got a plan. He wants to take you to the next level in your life. But He can only do it if we're humbled. Now, we can humble ourselves. The command was, humble yourselves, therefore. Humble yourselves, therefore. You see, we can humble ourselves, amen? That's a good thing. I need to take steps. I need to find ways of humbling myself and get into that Word of God. Maybe do a little bit of fasting and praying and allow God to search me and, 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 and willingly humble myself. Or, let me just say this, if you don't humble yourself, God can humble you. Now, He doesn't want to humble you. He'd rather you humble yourself because when He does it, it's quite painful. But He'll humble you. He'll humiliate you. 
till you become nothing so that He can build you up and be everything. We see this? Or is this okay? I know this isn't, you know, Joel Osteen's building a better you kind of a message, but uh, it's Bible. And I think it's going to be helpful if we really swallow this. This is the deeper Christian life, guys. Amen? So God can do it or we can do it. When offenses come, we can quit or we can get upset, we can get bitter, or we can say, God must be teaching me something. Why did I butt heads with my boss today? In such a, why, why, why did that go so bad today? Maybe God's teaching me something. Oh, well, preacher, I understand applying that to church and, and family, but are you going to talk about applying that into the lost world? And Yeah. You know, God knows we're supposed to go out there, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, them, the world, uh, we must needs go out and be among. We, we have to be, uh, but the Christian principles apply just the same. You understand, uh, the, the, the verse for children, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. It does not say children obey your parents in the Lord if they're Christians. You know what applies if you have lost parents? You see? These principles apply across the, across the board. So we have to ask ourselves, God, what are you teaching me in this? Spiritual response. Carnal response. Oh, they offended me and I'm so angry and bitter. And You see what I'm saying? I'm not talking to them the rest of my life. You are officially shunned. What's God teaching me? Have you ever been um, reprimanded at work? You've been reprimanded? I was in the army, and they don't hold back when they reprimand you, I'll tell you what. But the great thing in the army was this. When it's dealt with, it's done. It's over. Tomorrow's a new day. Uh, I thought that was pretty awesome. I, I, so, so it's caused me to, I don't get it when people just hold on to this thing forever. <laughs> you see, like the baboon. <laughs> um, but yeah, when you're reprimanded, and that starts, you know, you know, the right answer is to say nothing, right? The right answer is to say nothing. I saw a tweet uh, yesterday from a, from a pastor, and he said this. He said, um, the best two words in a marriage are shut up. Not words to be said, but words to be applied. So you're not trying to get the other one to shut up. It's you, sir. <laughs> you, ma'am, need to shut up. <laughs> Amen? When you're being reprimanded, the best response is to just be quiet, Right? But boy, you you starting thinking of some things you want to say, and there's a word for those that'll say what they want to say. What's the word? Fired. <laughs> Amen. No, you just take it. You're being reprimanded. But but boy, what's well? You're being well up. Your pride's under attack, and it's hurting. And you start seeing red. Maybe the sweat is coming to the outer layers of your head. And you, how many of you been there? Right? You kind of oh, I just want to. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> God's doing something. You got to ask yourself, God, what are you doing? It's pride. Humble yourselves before, uh, before your spouse. You ought to humble yourselves before your children. By the way, you have any idea how far that goes? There have been several times where I've had to humble myself before my children and just let them know, hey, kids, I was, I'm sorry. Dad was wrong here. Dad was wrong. You know, I, I only have so many years with them. In a couple months, Sadie's turning, turning nine. We're halfway through my influence with her. As, as, a, as the, the dad-daughter relationship. Sure, when she gets out of the house and stuff, I'll be a little more of a mentor and that kind of stuff, but not the, not the, the father-daughter relationship. I only have so long. And I want to keep that, I want to keep her heart. You understand? It goes a long ways. Has your, have your children ever heard you say, I'm sorry, I was wrong? Humble yourselves, therefore. Humble yourselves. You need the grace of God in the thing. So we see why God does it, why God humbles us, so He can give us His grace. Let's look at next how He does it. Listen, we can expect that something, someone is going to say something. Um, someone's going to respond in a manner that we don't like. Someone's going to say something in a way that we, don't, we didn't quite uh, expect. And let me just say this. You might want to mark this down. The problem, well, many, many offenses come because of unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. Um, unmet expectations bring offenses. Uh, 
here's a phrase. Listen, un, uh, 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 expectations ruin relationships. Just mark that down. Expectations ruin relationships. Say, what do you mean? Well, I expected so much from them, whether it be a marriage relationship or dating or even friendships. We have these expectations of each other, and if the expectations aren't met, what happens? We're offended. You may have certain expectations from church. There are certain expectations from pastors. Uh, I remember there was, a, there was a person that was coming to this church uh, before I even came along and, uh, and, and, and was really offended that my wife wasn't answering the phone. My wife was at a ladies' conference, a ladies' uh, counseling meeting, and, uh, and he was in a place where there was no reception out there in Newberry Springs. And here's the voicemail she left. If you and your church don't even care about me, and kind of went on and on and on, crying. Like, whoa. You know what happened? Unmet expectations. She, she thought we should be at her beck and call every minute of every day. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I took a job one time when I was a youth pastor and just kind of getting into ministry, and I had an unusual kind of a hybrid of a job. I, I was a groundskeeper on this property, but then I was also a youth pastor, and uh, and uh, my boss was my pastor as well as the manager of this property. So he was my boss in both jobs, basically. And, uh, and because of unmet expectations, he said things were going to be a certain way, and I, tra- I took him to mean something else. Uh, it just kept getting frustrating. We kept butting heads, and, and it got very difficult. Why? Unmet expectations. Let me tell you a little formula. The key to contentment is the expectation of nothing. The key to contentment is the expectation of nothing. You see, uh, when my wife and I were going through a premarital counseling, we read a book, and he was talking about, you know, don't expect your wife to cook like your mom. She's just getting started. She's never had to care for somebody else before. She's never had to cook you three meals a day and that kind of stuff. He says, don't expect her to be an expert. Expect burnt toast. And when the toast isn't burnt, that's a blessing. You see what I'm saying? Uh, but if your expectations are too high, you can get disappointed. You can be offended. This burnt toast is offensive to me. Amen? Expectations. Expectations cut us off from the blessings God has for us. And they keep us offendable. Uh, In the Bible, in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings 5, there was a man named Naaman. and, uh, And he was a leper. And he heard that the prophet Elisha might be able to help him. So this leper, though he was a leper, he was a military man, and he was a general or a commander, and he was in charge of all these people. He was a man of power. And he comes to the prophet's house, knocks on the door, and he's asked to wait outside. And after a while of waiting, he tells what the problem is, and and the prophet doesn't even go out to see this man, but rather sends his servant out to go tell the man, go dip in the Jordan seven times and your leprosy will be healed. You know, Naaman got offended. He, uh, he got upset. The Bible says it this way. It says he was wroth. He was wroth. He's a man of authority. He came all this way. No, the prophet's going to come out and see me. Amen? And, and here's what happens. Uh, uh, it, the same thing happens with us as well. Um, let me get my pages in order here. <clears throat> Yeah, so, so it says this, Naaman was wroth. Um, listen, instead of, instead of humbling himself uh, and, and doing what he said and going and dipping himself in the Jordan and just listening to what the man of God had to say, here's what happens. He was offended because of an unmet expectation from the man of God. Does that sound familiar? He got offended because of an unmet expectation from the preacher. And what happens is, instead of humbling ourselves, we get angry. And we missed the blessing that God had for us. Naaman almost missed the blessing because he had certain expectations. He almost didn't get healed because he was offended. But he eventually humbled himself and went and dipped himself in the River Jordan seven times and was healed. Amen? How many of us miss the healing in our marriages? How many of us miss the restoration of our, of our teenagers? And how many of us miss these things because we got offended? We got hurt. We had an unmet expectation. And, and, uh, and as a result, we blame the church. We blame the preacher. We blame God. And, uh, and next thing you know, you're missing what God had for you. There are some important passages in the Bible. And I just wonder if I could just share with you as a pastor for a moment. 
there's some very important messages, passages in the Bible. This is an a important passage for husbands. It says, Husbands, love your wives, agape, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In other words, husbands, you are to unconditionally love your wife in a sacrificial manner. You lay down your expectations and you lay down your ambitions and you lay down everything for the sake of your wife. Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. I know your husband's a knucklehead. I know he's kind of a jerk sometimes. But you're not submitting to him. You're submitting to God as unto the Lord. Amen. And let God deal with the knucklehead. You, you're, you're fine because you are in submission. Amen. You're protected. This is God's plan. Children, Ephesians 6.1, Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. That's a verse for the children. There's a verse for church members. There's a verse for pastors uh, uh, that they are to feed the flock of God which is among you. Not for filthy lucre's sake, but with a ready mind. Or to feed the flock of God. There's a verse for church members found in Hebrews. And it says, Obey them which have the rule over you. Who minister to you in the word. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you. uh, as uh, uh, As they that watch for your souls that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for this is unprofitable for you. You see, as a pastor, how many of you speak Spanish in here? A couple. What's Spanish for pastor? No. Oh, I mean, yeah, but okay, yeah, but what does it mean? What's the translation then from pastor to English? Shepherd. Amen. Shepherd. And that's what pastor means. It's a shepherd. Um, I love the title because the shepherd is the idea of caring. And the shepherd's idea of guiding, and, the she- and, and, and I think that's why the title pastor came on, came, uh, uh, caught on, because pastor is not used as much as the other titles in the Bible. Bishop is used more often, and elder, and those kinds of things, um, for the same office. But it's shepherd. You know, sometimes uh, when you have a sheep that keeps wandering away, now, of course, the chief shepherd is Jesus Christ, and often, often the pastor refers to himself as the under-shepherd, Amen. Sometimes the sheep keeps wandering away, and, and we have to keep bringing him back. And maybe they send out the sheep dog, and he kind of nips at him for a while until he comes, comes back. And that's a little bit of chastisement. But sometimes the chastisement can get pretty hard. And that shepherd, what he'll do is he'll go and he'll, he'll break the sheep's leg. And then he'll carry the sheep on his shoulders until that leg is healed. It's a beautiful picture, by the way. And once that leg is healed, he puts that sheep down. That sheep stays right by the shepherd. Sometimes God has to break our legs and then nurture us through that thing. So we'll quit going out there. Why? What's out there? There's a wolf, right? He's a roaring lion and, and, and so forth. Um, wants to devour us, you see. So here's what the Bible says. It says to obey them that have the rule over you. As they that must give an account that they may do it with... Uh, with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Who's it unprofitable for? For the church member. All right? Now, here's the idea. When I bring up your name before God, and I do, is it joyful or grievous to me? Now, it depends on whose name it is. No, I'm serious. That's what this verse is talking about. There are times I come before the Lord and I say, God, oh, thank you for so and so. Thank you for sending them to our church. They've been such a blessing. And Lord, would you, would you just bless them and guide them and take care of them and help them and help them to grow and all that. And, and, and you know what it is? It's joy. And God says, I, I, I noticed that. Amen. Then there's some, Lord, I just, they just don't get it. They're just, they're resisting. They're stirring up trouble in the church. They're, they're being abusive to their family. I, I mean, the list could go on and it's grieving me. It's heavy. I'm losing sleep and it's bothering me. Listen, it says, it grieves me, but it's unprofitable for them. And let me just say this. They get the harder end of the deal. God will tap me on the back and say, it's going to be all right. And I'm fine with a little bit of grief, but the unprofitable is for them. All I'm just saying is this. There's certain things that need to fall in place. We need to humble ourselves and find out where God has us or else we're going to just keep getting offended left and right. And it's unprofitable. We're not going to grow. We're not going to be helped. I need to move on. Um, <clears throat> you see, uh, Naaman almost lost the blessing because of his unmet expectations. If you get offended, you could miss something, church. 
If you get offended, you can miss something for the rest of your life. Uh, can I tell you something? I'm not perfect. Neither are you. I think sometimes we hold the pastor to a higher standard. And then we hold the pastor's kids to a higher standard. You see a pastor's kid, the pastor's kid is unruly. Have you seen the other kids? <laughs> All I'm saying is this, you know, pastor's kids are, are just as susceptible to things. I, I've, I've helped, uh, dealt with, met with uh, several pastors whose, whose teenage daughter ran, ran, ran off or, or had, a, had a teenager that tried to commit suicide, different things like that. Understand the pastor has a bigger target on his back, by the way. You ought to pray. You ought to fight. But I'll tell you what, I won't expect you to be perfect if you don't expect me to be perfect. And same with our kids. Is that a good deal? All right. There was a couple that was getting counsel from a visiting preacher. Remember, we, we had a couple weeks ago, we had a visiting preacher, in, and uh, there was a couple in the church getting counsel from this guy because he was an old man. And he asked him, he said, why don't you go to your preacher? Uh, about this, and they said, well, you know, he's, he's a young man. He, this preacher was only like 25 years old. He's a young man. He doesn't know these things. And, he, and the guy said to him, he said, young or not, that's God's man. That's the pastor God chose for that church. You know, Paul was never married. Who does he think he is giving marital advice? He is never married. He's the one who wrote, husbands love your wives and wives submit to your husbands. It's irrelevant. It, truth is truth. Amen? And now that, that's God's man. That's the man God put there. Um, understand God's structure. We may not understand things fully, but we can by faith trust God's way. Amen? God offends us to humble us so He can give grace and exalt us. In Numbers 12 and in Job 30, the Bible speaks of it being an insult to spit in someone's face. Uh, that's why no one's in the front row this morning. It's insulting to spit in someone's face. And yet, over in uh, John chapter 9, let me go there real quick. We have a very interesting miracle that Jesus did. What if Jesus spat in your face? Would you be offended? Oh, that's from Jesus. That's like holy saliva, right? No, spit is spit, right? In John chapter 9, you don't turn there if you don't want. Uh, in verse 6 says, when he thus spoken, uh, let me back up, uh, uh, there was a blind man that, that, that Jesus passed by, had been blind from his birth and so forth, and he asked Jesus if he would heal him. And verse 6 says, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay from the spittle. So he spit in the ground and put some mud together and he had anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said to him, go wash in the pool of uh, uh, Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Interesting thing here. Uh, Jesus could have spoken. Jesus could have just laid hands on him. Jesus could have done all kinds of things. What does he do? He spits in the guy's eyes. I mean, he spat on the ground first, then rubbed mud in his eyes with spit. And then if that wasn't enough, he sends him across town to go wash it out. Wait a minute. You made the mess. You wash it out. <laughs> if that guy got offended... I just asked for a little bit of help, and you spit in my face? Can you, can you see it? He would have missed out on a major blessing, wouldn't he have, if he got offended? You see, God humbles us so He can give us grace. And in this case, when He gave the grace, He gave a blessing, sight. You know, some of us need some spiritual sight, amen? We need to be humbled a little bit so we can experience God's grace. Um, so then... What if, what if when we get to heaven, we see all of these missed blessings that God wanted to send us, but He never did because we were offended? We didn't allow it to humble us. Matthew 5, 20, 15, 22 is probably one of the most powerful illustrations of this. Go ahead and turn there if you would. We're almost done, I promise. Matthew 15. Um, look at verse 21, Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried at him, saying, 
Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So this woman was a Canaanite. All right. She comes to Jesus and, and says that her, her child uh, is possessed. Verse 23. But he answered her not a word. How have you been offended when someone ignores you? Jesus flat out ignored this woman. He didn't answer her. He, he didn't listen to her. He didn't, he didn't respond to her in any manner. Well, first of all, he's a Jew and she's a Canaanite. You understand something? That she's not even supposed to be alive right now. The Canaanites were supposed to be destroyed way hundreds of years ago. Remember, um, uh, uh, remember uh, Haman in the book of Esther? Wanted to kill all the Jews? He was of the same lineage as this woman. They were, supposed to, they were the sworn enemies of the Jews, and they were supposed to be destroyed way ago with Solomon. I'm sorry, with, with Saul, with King Saul back then. And, uh, and she's coming, and she's asking Jesus a question, and he, he ignores her, doesn't even answer. Uh, verse 23, he answered not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. In other words, make her go away. She's bugging us, and you're ignoring her. And, and you see how rude they're being to this woman? Verse 24, And he answered and said, I'm not sent but the, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he looks at the woman, finally responds and says, I'm not here for you. It'd be like this, okay? We have uh, church members, and, and, uh, and, and a visitor comes and says, Pastor, could I have a moment of your time? And I'll, I say to them, I'm not here for you. I'm here for the church members. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I'm not sent to you. I'm sent to my people. I'm sent to the Jews, the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel, or the house of Israel. Verse 25, then uh, she came and worshipped him. <laughs> she worshipped him after this. Lay, bowed down before him and said, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not me to take the children's bread and shall cast it to dogs. He ignores her, says he's not come to her. Uh, refuses her service, if you would, and then calls her a dog. Now, back then, dogs weren't little pets that we have today. Dogs were scavengers. They were a nuisance. They were would run around and get into trash and that kind of stuff. He calls her a dog. Yeah, this is Jesus we're talking about. Jesus wouldn't do that. Come on. Hang on now. But he answered and said, uh, to cast the dogs, verse 27, and she said, Truth, Lord. She just took that. She didn't get offended. She just took it. Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Now get this. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Question. If this woman got offended, would her daughter have been healed? No. In fact, I almost wonder if Jesus was checking, because what was he doing? He was humbling her. He was humiliating her. I almost wonder if Jesus was seeing, how low is this woman willing to go for the blessing? How low will she go for the blessing? How low will you go for the blessing? We don't like that. It's uncomfortable. It's, I'm offended. I don't want to go this route. Why, why would God do this? Because God wants to see how desperate you are. You know why we, where pride becomes a crutch? Because we don't want people to see really how helpless we are. So we want to look like we got our act together. We want to look like we got things figured out. Are we okay? Now, so God has purpose for pride. Satan has purpose. Or God has a purpose for offenses, and that is to get rid of pride. Satan has a purpose for offenses too. Did you know that? A man gets upset and uh, 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 there, uh, 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 I'll tell you a story here. There was a man in a church, big old burly man, right? And every month, like we have our birthday and anniversary night, every, uh, every time there was a birthday in the church, in the evening service, the preacher would, they would sing happy birthday to the person. Well, one night, there was a lot of stuff going on. He didn't sing happy birthday. This guy is bothered all week, finally gets a meeting with the pastor, gets into the office, and he starts bawling like a baby. Pastor, you didn't sing happy birthday to me. And at first, the preacher thought it was a joke. What's wrong with this guy? He didn't sing happy birthday to me. And that guy got so offended, he left. People that, the devil wants to do that because, let me say this, people that get offended become a bad testimony. Well, I, I knew a Christian once and, oh, they were. Or I went to church once and used to go to church, but then they, they, they hurt me. They become a bad testimony. When you're offended, you, you can backslide, you drop out of church, or, or instead of owning up to things, you will leave a good Bible-preaching church and go to an apostate church. 
You know it's wrong. You know their doctrine's wrong. You know the, but, but at least I'm not getting offended. Right? I can go a lot of places with that one, but I'm going to move on. So remember our opening story. The preacher calls the family of the deacon. and says, uh, you know, he's so-and-so, brother so-and-so there. The wife says, hold on, he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting. She comes back on the phone. She says, I'm sorry, he can't talk right now. So he tries calling back several other times. And he finally finds out that he was offended because the woman commented on his tie. And then he was further offended that the preacher didn't notice he missed that morning service. And then he was further offended that the preacher didn't follow up with him after he missed the deacon's meeting. And then he was further offended to the point where he thinks the preacher just has it out for him that it took him this long to call, and that man never came back to church. Oh, his family kept going to church, and his, do- and his kids kept going to church, but he stayed out and kept getting bitter, and he wasn't growing. And, uh, and, 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 and let me just say this. You can't keep going for the Lord apart from church. It's his plan. Uh, in Hebrews it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. We need that. Even so much more the days see the day approaching. Listen, there may be people that know more Bible than your pastor. That's not the point. The point is this is God's institution and God's, God's, uh, God's plan. And I don't know all the ins and outs about it, why God does it this way. But you will not grow. You will not be blessed. Your children will not be blessed when you drop out of church. And I'm not saying it's to get you from dropping out of church. I'm just saying the devil has a plan with offenses. And I've seen it. There are many, in fact, if it weren't for offenses, our church would probably be uh, uh, busting out the seams right now. <laughs> Amen? Number three, and lastly, don't worry, this last one's short. We have the possibility of offenses, the positive purpose for offenses. Notice the peace for offenses. The Bible said in our, te- our opening text in Psalm 119, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Very interesting. The Bible connects offenses with your relationship to the Bible. Great peace have they which love the Word of God, and nothing shall offend them. You know, it's interesting. When you fall in love with God and you fall in love with His Word, your identity, your security comes from God. Uh, you begin to care less about what people think. You begin to care less about your image. You begin to care less about certain things because, quite frankly, you know that you're accepted in the Beloved, that God loves you, and that's not going to change. So what do we do to find peace in offenses? First of all, develop a proper relationship with the Word of God. Do you love the Word of God? In that same uh, Psalm, Psalm 119, uh, we can't hardly go through that thing without finding a, some sort of reference to the Bible. Uh, the largest chapter in the entire Bible, Psalm 119, is committed to the love and relationship to the Word of God. He says, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. He so loved the Word of God. He was in that thing day and night, meditating on it. In fact, in fact this is the only way, place in the Bible you find prosperity, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, success in the Bible. You find it in conjunction to the relationship with the Word of God. He meditates there in day and night and, and does it in Joshua 1.8. He says, then you shall have true success and your way will be prosperous. Do you love the Word of God? Develop a proper relationship with the Word of God. Be in there day and night. You ought to purpose never to put pellet in your head at night if you haven't spent some time in the Word of God. I'm not talking about reading through it in a year or even reading through it in a, reading through it in a month. or in the, I'm just talking about have you gotten some Scripture before you pellet your head at night? Fall in love with the Bible. By the way, here's what you're going to find. People that are easily offended, you know who they are. Yeah, yeah, you feel like you have to walk on eggshells around them. You're going to find they don't spend time in the Word of God. Preacher, that's very judgmental. Hey, I've been working with people long enough to, to just see the patterns. Those who are thriving and those who are connecting the dots and growing from the preaching and those kinds of stuff, those people are reading the Bible and they're getting into it. Those that nothing cha- is changing day in and day out, though they might be faithful, they're getting nothing from it. Why? Because they're not feeding themselves. And before long, they come to the preacher and say, Pastor, we're just not getting fed anymore. Feed yourselves. Amen. You've got, you've got the meal. We're not in a country where you can't have a Bible. You've got the Word of God. Read it. 
It's not supposed to be a paperweight. It's not supposed to be a hood ornament, dash ornament, bobblehead. People just leave it in their car right there, and then, then the bindings falls apart. It's been sitting in the sun. It's Sunday. Where's my Bible? Develop a proper relationship with the Word of God. Uh, secondly, how do we find peace for offenses? Dodge offensive people. <laughs> Nearness is likeness, right? If you walk with the wise, you'll be wise, but the companion of fools shall be destroyed. Dodge offensive people. They're gonna, those that will come and try to take up your offense and those that will try to get you to take up their offense. The Bible says in Romans 16, it says, Mark them which cause uh, uh, divisions contrary to the doctrine which you received, uh, divisions and offenses, and it says, and avoid them. Here's what it means. It doesn't mean ignore their calls and all this kind of stuff. It means that, oh, that offensive person comes. You greet them in church. Hey, brother, how you doing? I got, I got something to do over here. I, you just don't spend time with them. You're not mean to them. You just avoid them. Don't let that be your close companion, amen? Because you'll become offensive and offend it. So dodge offensive people. And lastly, to have peace and offenses, you ought to die to self daily. Die to self daily. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said these words, I die daily. I want to write this down. Offenses expose pride. Offenses expose pride. How many of you ever been to a cemetery? Yeah. You ever gone to a cemetery? I want to try this experiment sometimes. Sometime. Go down there and uh, find one of the grave markers and see the name on there and, and start insulting the person. Mr. Jones, you're such a pathetic excuse for a human being. And just start telling them all kinds of stuff about them. And, and you'll be surprised at their responses. Their responses may vary, but it's usually going to be something like crickets. Nothing. Why? Why don't they respond? Why didn't they get offended? Why aren't their feelings hurt? Anybody? They're dead. And if I'm to be crucified with Christ, if I'm to reckon myself dead, why do I get offended? Why do I get all bothered? Because I'm still alive. I need to die to myself. I need to die to the flesh. I don't need to die to the offenses, die to the pride. I die daily, every day. Reckon yourself to be dead. God, I'm getting up today and I'm dead. I'm dead, I'm going to be alive unto Christ. That means only things that God directs, only things that God allows in my life, am I going to be able to do. Let Him be a puppet master of your life. I'll just be a limp corpse. And let Him just start leading me. Here's where we're going today, right? How do you do that? Prayer, meditation, scriptures, amen? Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing, nothing shall offend them. Is that you today? Are you offended or are you unoffendable? 